thank you so much for joining us again for another Days of Miracle program. Happy Losa, everybody. Yes. Happy yes. Losa, wherever you are in the world. Vena Robina is in New York, so it's early morning. Yeah, actually, I'm in San Francisco. I just came over here, so it's 5.30 here. Oh, my goodness. Vena Robina, we could have changed the time. Oh, of course not. I'm so happy. But this, it's not, I, the lighting here is not very good. So but you can see me a little bit, right? You can yes, see yes, me. yes. It's perfect. Okay. Yeah. It's actually what better than you? mine, Ben Barubina. Okay. No, <laughs> okay, dearest. So welcome, everybody, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think Australia is almost going to bed. And welcome okay. to Losar. Today is the first day of the Tibetan New Year and the first day of the Days of Miracles, which are the first 15 days of the Tibetan calendar. So we are, are so happy to have Venable Robina today with us for the fourth time we're running this program. And every time Venable Robina was so kind to open it for us because today we also um, remember Lama Yeshe, Lama Yeshe's kindness because uh, Lama Yeshe passed on exactly 40 years ago on Losa Day in 1984 and Venerobina is the, you know, one of Lama Yeshe's students, you know, and it's so wonderful that uh, we have her with us. Uh, so some of you might not know Venerobina. So Venerobina, do you mind if I introduce you very quickly? Uh, sure, go on ahead. That's fine. Um, so, Vena Robina comes from Australia, was born in Australia, and in her childhood, I believe, was a very devoted Catholic. Uh, so, always yearning to be with God, isn't it, Vena Robina? And I was in love with God, definitely. And studying classical music beautiful voice. And then when a Bruguiba grew up and went to London and now it's the hippie times, it's the sixties, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So when a Robina became radical about pretty much everything one could become radical about. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, it's a hippie time. That sounds pretty good. Try to right. find it. That's exactly, <laughs> try to find the same on the planet. Right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> radical left. Radical feminists, radical yes. lesbians, until there was nobody else left to be That's right. <laughs> radical about. Yes. And then uh, studying martial art, very active. Yeah, whoever knows Vena Barubina yes. knows Vena Barubina is very active. And then something happens. Uh, maybe Vena Barubina uh, will tell the story. A truck ran over her foot, and Vena Barubina had to stop which is very rare. And when Robina stopped, I think, in Shenrezig Institute, yeah, which was just, I think, founded, maybe? Um, a year, about a year, yeah. Yeah, uh, in Shenrezig Institute on the um, uh, Sunshine Coast, yeah, in Australia. And there she met Lama Yeshi in a course. And uh, and Robina always says he is the first man she listened to. Uh, and so it started when Robina became a student of Lama Yeshe and yeah. then became ordained in 1978. And yeah. since then has tirelessly, tirelessly served uh, the FPMT organization uh, Tushita yeah. is part of in the last over four decades. It's quite, quite amazing. It's quite, quite mind boggling when Robina. Robina. Um, so when Robina was the editing director of Wisdom Publication, the editing uh, uh, the editor of Mandala magazine, the director of uh, Liberation Prison Project, and teaching, of course, all around the world for over yeah forty years um, tirelessly. I, I remember one retreat with Lama Zopa Rinpoche and Lama Zopa Rinpoche uh, looked at Venerobina and one could hear it very quietly, Rinpoche is saying, I don't know how she does it. Um, you know, zooming around the world uh, tirelessly. Thank you so much, Venerable Rubina, for oh, being with us again on this very auspicious occasion. And uh, could I please, please, because it's such an auspicious occasion and the start of our season, uh, could I please offer a little mandala shortly? Absolutely, go on. <laughs> 
O holy and perfect pure Lama from the clouds of compassion that form in the skies of your Dharmakaya wisdom, please release a rain of vast and profound Dharma precisely in accordance with the needs of those to be trained. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Punyayatayami. Wonderful, Kunpen, Venerable Kunpen. Thank you so much. This is so good. Happy to be here, dearest people. I wish I could be there personally, but maybe one day I'll come before I'm dead. We'll please, see. please, please. Good, good. <laughs> but Zoom, I mean, Zoom has changed the world quite a lot. There's His Holiness the Dalai Lama so kindly, isn't it? Offering initiations online. He's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, so kind. So, anyway, um, so we're here together. I'm, I'll try and sing. I'll get. I got a bit asthmatic this morning. We'll see what happens if I sing. We'll try and sing our little refuge prayer, just setting us in the right. Well, really, it's our prayer. It's the prayer that expresses our refuge, the first two lines. But the second two lines are really just expressing what the lamas say is our motivation, which really just means stating our purpose. Why are we here together? Why are we doing this? Because, because we all know from Buddha's teachings that what goes on in our mind, not the action, of the body and speech, but what goes on in our mind that drives the action of body and speech is the main thing. So we make that as altruistic as possible. We think, you know, we're going to listen here, just, have, just who knows what's going to come. We're going to talk, discuss, so that we can take some advice, take some inspiration from it. Certainly talking about the holy beings. The main one is to have it be inspired, you know, to want to be like them, which means to develop our, to perfection our marvelous qualities and to rid the mind utterly of all the nonsense, which is what Buddha has found is possible, which is the meaning of Buddha. So for this reason, we're together. Think like this. So may, even if 1% of it makes sense, let's put it into practice, you know. <clears throat> because nothing ever leaves our mind. Everything, nothing goes astray. Everything we hear, think and do and taste and touch and smell stays in the mind. So that's encouraging. So these little bit, 90 minutes together, maybe make it useful, you know. So I'll oh, so sing it in Tibetan. Our first two lines express our refuge. Sange Chetang Soke Chognam La Janchu Badu Dagni Kyabsu Chi Dagi Chernian Gipe Sonam Ki Jola Penche Sange Drumpa Shok Sange Chetang Soke Chognam La Janchu Badu Dagni Kyabsu Chi Dagi Chernian Gipe Sonam Ki Jola Penche Sange Drumpa Shok Sange Chetang Soke Chognam La Janchu Badu Dagni Kyabsu Chi Dagi Chernian well, you know, very Venerable Kunpen is very kindly summarizing my life. And it's a bit like that. It was like that. And I think the thing is, I'm a, I can always remember from the time I was very little, I didn't sort of put it in these words. But I mean, I was, um, yeah, I mean, my first one was I really was in love with God. You know, I was, I didn't, I didn't act like I was holy. I was actually the naughtiest kid. I didn't talk about it. I just assumed everybody thought like this. I'd think about God, you know. I don't, I don't think about, I thought much about Jesus. I like God, this concept of God being everywhere, this kind of all powerful, all knowing energy. I, it really appealed to me, you know. And of course, when we think about the Buddhist teachings, when we think about the Dharmakaya, we think about the meaning of Buddha. It's the same, essentially, you know, this idea of all-knowing, all-compassionate, all-wise energy pervading the universe, you know. I mean, I remember I gave a talk at the Catholic University in Melbourne a few years ago. They asked me to give a talk, and I had no idea what to talk about. I looked up the dictionary, the definition of God. Well, it said infinite wisdom, infinite compassion, infinite power. Well, I thought, well, that's interesting. That's the definition of Buddha, you know. So my talk was the similarities between the definition of God and Buddha. I'm not sure if the Catholics liked it, but it was that. Of course, the differences are that they they call that the creator and all that. And of course, Buddha's not, that's not Buddha's view. His view is that we can all become that, you know. So I, I think, um, yeah, so so I think what was mo what the things that I remember from a child that was it was very inspiring. I wanted to be inspired, you know. So and I think and I wanted to and then as I sort of you know I gave up God when I was about nineteen and just sort of went through this process. And I suppose thinking of it, it was really the process of trying to find the way to see the world, find find the way to see what the world is all about, and in particular in terms of suffering. So first, this radical political activist is all about suffering, you know, supporting all the the, uh, the, the downtrodden and all of that, you know. So I it, and always looking for someone. So I, I remember when I was a bit of sort of rad, I like the Chinese tea, you know, the the you know I remember the time of the of being a radical lefty and sort of admiring Mao Zedong. You could see there was wanted someone to inspire you, you know. And then it was different times, different people. So when I finally kind of exhausted all my options, as 
one can say, you know, who to blame for the world. And I, this car ran over my foot, this, you know, seemingly accident, seeming accident. But these llamas know what they're doing. They stopped, they stopped, Lama Yeshi stopped me in my tracks, I'm quite sure. And then I saw a poster and there was this name, Lama Yeshi, you know. And even until today, I always think, because I thought then, where have I heard his name? And I think today, I'm sure I've heard his name before. And I, but of course I hadn't, you know, it was, this is the karmic connection. And this is why it's encouraging to hear that whatever we think, do, say, touch, smell, hear, whatever, stays in the mind. It stays in the mind in our memory. It, it doesn't disappear, which is why when I saw that name, Lami Yeshi, something was triggered, you know. So I had the opportunity because I couldn't do my karate. I was totally involved in my karate. So I went up to Chen Raising Institute and met Lami Yeshi. In fact, Lama Zopa too, you know. So I know that it was difficult. It was a difficult for me because at that point I'd been a radical feminist, you know, totally radical. And it was quite shocking that uh, even though these teachings were kind of really medieval, Lama Zopa gave the teachings, one intensive month of Lam Rim. And I really did not understand his words. I heard the English. I heard his words, but couldn't frame anything. It was just this arcane, because Lama Zopa was talking exactly like Lama, Sok Lama Sonkapa talked, you know in the 1400s. It hadn't changed, you know. So it was very hard for me to, to understand what he was talking about. But it was it was the it was the it was Lama Yeshi, especially but also Lama Zopa, that they were the examples. I mean it was if if I'd just been reading that book, it wouldn't have touched me. But it was this person. This person, you know, we need so for me, I think we need to be inspired. And the more and all the more I think when we understand the teachings, we understand attachment, and we understand that our deepest attachment is to be liked and approved of, then in a way getting someone having a person as your spiritual teacher, you're utilizing that delusion. You know, we I mean, how marvelous to be approved of somebody who's worthy of approving of you, you know. Who's somebody because we're all yearning to be loved. Lama Yeshi would say, We all want to be loved, we're all dying for love. He said, Well, why, you know, when we give our hearts to any old peanut, so why not give our heart to somebody we can trust, you know, and who can actually show us what to do with ourselves? So, that for me is the function of a teacher. I mean, and Lama Yeshi for me was the very first one, of course. I mean, Lama Zopa was there too, and I often talk about, but it took me 10 years to recognize Lama Zopa as my, um, as my guru. I'll talk about Rumshe as well, same time. Because when I, um, my very first retreat was at Tushita, my very first, after Kopan, my, my Kopan teachings, I met him in Queensland. I went the year later, went to, went to Kopan and then went to Tushita. 1978, um, I did Vajrasattva. I did Tara retreat first, a Tara retreat. That's where I became a nun. And then did my, um, did my Vajrasattva retreat later in the year, in the summer, 1978. And I remember I had this vivid dream because Lama Yeshi was the one who touched my heart. It completely moved me, you know. I'll just talk about both of them together. But And, and Lama Zopa too, but he was always behind Lama Yeshi for me. He, I'm sure if Lama Yeshi hadn't been at that first teaching, I somehow wouldn't have been hooked. It was Lama Yeshi's style, his down to earth. His, he, I found him incredibly appealing just to look at him, you know. I mean, the teaching was so crowded. This is Lama Yeshi again, back to Lama Yeshi. And even I could just see his arm. I was happy with that. Whatever I saw of Lama, it sort of made me content, you know. And, I, and every word he said just made so much sense. I couldn't understand Rinpoche, but Lama just made it simple. He made it down to earth. And he was always encouraging. And I see this from all the years. I'm going to tell you about my dream in a minute. I see, in all the years of editing Lama, you know, you can see that he's doing everything in his power to lift us. Because he could see the 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 incredible self pity and suffering of his first, you know, the, when he first met modern people. So we, we had to be lifted up, you know. We had to be lifted up, and this is what Lama did. And we need that. We, we I mean, we know one kind, one person saying one kind word to us can change the day. So we are, we are because we're so fragile, because we have so much ego grasping and attachment, and we can be so upset so easily by things and dragged down. Having one thing happen, one kind person smile at you, a stranger can really deeply change us. So we need to be inspired. We want to have somebody whom we can trust our heart with. That's for sure. So Lama Yeshi, I remember, so anyway, what am I saying here with Lama? So I, and so I knew Lama Zopa was this perfect being. I mean, it was very clear. He was, and what was also very inspiring. This is the thing that really touched me. Really was very powerful. Actually, it, I'd learned, you know, from being at the. I was there for two months. I learned that Lama Zopa Rinpoche was Lama Yeshi's disciple. And so it was, in, and I figured, well, you know, if Lama Zopa is a disciple and Lama Yeshi's a Lama, well, that's a pretty good proof of Lama Yeshi. I mean, that really is helpful to see, you know, if someone's open with this impeccable student and this extraordinary person, clearly very holy, clearly authentic. If he is a disciple, even though I couldn't understand his words, 
then that's, you know, of Lama Yeshi. Well, that's good enough proof, you know. So anyway, during my Vajrasattva retreat at Tushita, after I'd become a nun, this is about, this will be about 76, two years, about two years later, two years after I first met them. I was in Tushita during my um, Vajrasattva retreat. And I had this vivid dream of Lama Zopa. And I, I knew the Lama Yeshi, I'll talk about that too, but I knew the Lama Yeshi was my teacher, I'd sort of, during the first course. But I knew that I had this dream of Lama Zopa, and it was all a whole bunch of students. We were all at, at, um, at uh, uh, Rajgir, at Valjapi, Rajgir, Valjgir. No, what do you call it? Um, oh, I suddenly forgot. What's the name of the monastery there? The huge, huge... Nalanda, Nalanda Monastery, yeah. I didn't know it was Nalanda Monastery Ruins until I went there years later. But it was all the students were there at Nalanda Monastery Ruins. And Rimache called me out. He called me over and he put his text, you know, his long folio text over my one shoulder. And he put his robe over my other shoulder. And he said to follow him out. So I thought this was a nice dream. And I told one Lama I knew in Dharamsala after my retreat. And he said, oh, that's the Lama who leads you to enlightenment. And I was very surprised because I I always figured, I didn't know you could have more than one teacher, but I figured Lama Yeshi was my root Lama, you know. So I knew in, in my mind he was then, but it took me 10 years for my heart to be ready. It was very strange. He, I knew for ten, I knew clearly he was also that, but it took me 10 years for the penny to drop. It was very curious, you know, which means for my heart to be ready to kind of be advised by Rinpoche, basically. So he left me alone for those 10 years, you know, because my mind wasn't ready. But Lama Yeshi, though, it was the it was this very first time I saw him, and it was inspiring. I, I mean, I, I didn't even if I didn't know the teachings, I figured I'd like to be like him, and that's pretty powerful. We need that. We want that. We want to be lifted. You know, I mean, in my life, I was looking for love. Of course, I was like everybody in one way or another. I knew I didn't want to have you know a person, a husband in living with a husband in the same bed in the same house with a bunch of children in other bedrooms. I didn't want that life. That was horrifying to me. I'd rather go to prison. I wanted to be free. Even I'd say those words to me. I wanted the truth. And I wanted freedom. That's how I felt. And of course, I mean by freedom to do what I want, when I want, how I want, exactly where I want. You know, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And that can be a good quality. It can be awful as well. I don't want to be constricted. I don't want to be restricted. So I didn't want to live with anybody. I didn't want to have happiness that way. But I knew I wanted something. I knew I wanted a way to think. I wanted a way to see the world. And I was very so so committed to all these different ways of seeing, trying to find the way the world is, trying to find what caused the suffering. And then hearing the lamas somehow after those ten intensive years for me it was ten intensive years. Of, it was very internal, you know. And knowing this was my path, knowing from the first day it was my path. It took me a while to process it all. And then by the end of the two months, it was clear to me that Lama Yeshi. I mean, I liked him a lot. I didn't say he was my lama, but I went back home to Melbourne, you know, a thousand miles down south, and I'd and I'd do something every day. And then one day, halfway through that year, that first year after I'd met them, the penny dropped. And I remember thinking to myself, he is my lover, he's my guru. But I felt embarrassed, you know, I'd been this radical feminist, and to have a male teacher called a guru was about the worst disgusting thing you could ever have. So I remember whispering to my sister Polly, I've got a guru, Polly, but don't tell anybody, you know. So, I, but I just, it was clear to me something had shifted in my mind. I didn't know even really the meaning, but I knew this person was this person for my life. There's no question. So, six, I did different work with. I remember it was. Um, uh, I did some things, and I went back for six months later for the second course at Chen Rezi, and I decided I would inform Lama Yeshi. I didn't know you're supposed to ask. I'm being so proud. I asked, but I inf I wanted to inform him I was his that I had decided he was my guru. But I was too proud to say the words, you are my guru. I said I respected him. I told him I respected him. I meant that he was my guru. I mean, so proud. And he said, Yes, I know, dear. So it was from that moment, and this is the thing, this is for me the power of a teacher, the power. And it's sort of obvious. When you if you respect and like somebody, you're gonna listen to them. You know, a person can't force you to do anything. But if you like that person, if you respect that person, you are, your heart is wide open. And I think that's the, that's the real thing. You know, we need we need the human experience, the, the Buddha in human form, really. And that's exactly what the guru is. I mean, we talk about guru as if somehow some kind of weird thing. but And then we talk about Shakyamuni Buddha. But, I mean, he was at that time exactly what the guru is for us now. Buddha, you see, when we understand Buddha, Buddha means the Buddha's mind. Actual Buddha is the Dharmakaya. Actual Buddha is the consciousness, the mind that pervades the universe, that is infinitely wise and compassionate and powerful. But what good is that? We're hopeless. We can't contact that. So they manifest in a body that looks like you and me. Well, that's what the guru is, you know. 
That's what it means. So he was the guru of that time. Buddha is this all-knowing, compassionate mind, and he was the manifestation in human form of the Buddha. Well, that's what our guru is today. That's what the Dalai Lama is. That's what our Lamas are. They are the human embodiment of the Buddha for us because we're not intelligent enough to contact Buddha's mind, you know. That's what Jesus was for the Christ is for the Christians, the human embodiment of God. We need that and how kind they are, these holy beings, to manifest in a form that we can communicate with. So I remember Lama from, from day one, from this moment that I decided and I'd contact and saw Lama and, and he gave me a practice. But from that second, even at that meeting, I remember something had shifted because I had decided that I was, you know, that that I, that I trusted him, that I, I, I wanted, he was my Lama, which meant I, it's in a sense what you're doing when you do that, you're giving permission to that person to tell you what to do. So, and that's why really, I always say it like this, we choose the guru. And that's really true. We choose the guru. We're not some kind of little lemming that just goes and does whatever somebody wants. We decide whom we are going to listen to. We have to decide. I mean, I knew in that dream that Lama Zopa was my teacher, but I wasn't ready. So Lama Zopa left me alone for 10 years. He would, when he saw me, just chat and say hello. He Because my mind, had, my heart hadn't opened. I hadn't known. I didn't know experientially that he was my teacher. And 10 years later, you know, the penny dropped finally. And then Rinpoche picked me up and, you know, told me what to do basically. So that's the thing with, we need, we need this so badly. This is so clear to me. We need this. And it's sort of obvious. You want to play tennis. You want to become a cook. You want to be a musician. You need the human embodiment. I mean, it, Nishi, can you unmute please? I mean, mute. Nishi, can you mute yourself, darling? There you go. Well done. Sorry, that was your job, couldn't Ben. I can't help but be the boss, you see. <laughs> anyway, um, we want, you know, we we want, we need, we need, we need to be inspired. We need to be lifted up because that's the irony of ego. We're all feeling hopeless. We all think, we, you know, all our negative thoughts preoccupy us. I've never yet met a person who says I can't stop thinking good thoughts. I mean, until we're highly realized, until we've done an incredible amount of mental training, we're going to we go, we're going to have the uncontrolled crazy thoughts coming in. And of course, because we we believe every word they say, well, then we think we're just this terrible person. Nobody nobody has a good view of themselves until you highly realize. It. But Lami Yeshi, from day one, he could he tried it every way he could, and I can see this from editing his teachings. It just blows my mind the effort he went to to lift us, to say, to find us, to find a way for us to to become inspired. You know to know that we've got this extraordinary potential. I mean, it's all there in the books. But to know it's possible and then to see body, a person in front of you who's actually embodying it, you can't wish for anything better than that, you know. And so, of course, this is where the danger area is because we mystify all this business. We mystify spiritual teachings. And because we have so much attachment, we jump in the deep end at the first person who smiles at us, you know, and we're so pathetic. So we've got to be very cautious, very intelligent about how we choose a person who who is for us validly the Buddha, you know, manifesting as the Buddha. We and and because we need it, we need we need the instructions, you know. And then because we're so fragile, because we're so up and down like a yo-yo, we have so much attachment to neediness. And maybe one day, you know, the lama mightn't look at you perfectly, mightn't stroke you perfectly, and say sweet words to you. You have a panic attack. And then, you know, and then you think, oh, well, he can't be Buddha. How can he be Buddha if he does that? Because we're so we're such like babies, you know. So it's so important when we do choose our teachers, check carefully, use your intelligence, you know, just like you would a yoga teacher, just like you would, uh, you know, a cook, just like you would a restaurant. We walk, we check up first, you know, we use our intelligence. It's so important to do this. And then when we have established with you know, with strong analysis that this person is valid, then you then you de then you have to also then develop the confidence because these lamas. I mean, from that moment when I when I in that meeting with Lama, something shifted, and already, I mean, he, I, I noticed in something he said to me, it helped me see my mind, and I never thought of seeing my mind. I'd never done that job in my life. I didn't know what it meant see my mind. But that first moment, that first moment, having my having realized he was my teacher, and I didn't know all these words then, already his words became powerful for me, and I could see something in my mind. And it was shocking to me, you know. And that first meeting, I remember, second meeting, second meeting, yeah. It was shocking to me because what I'd done was, like I said, was give him permission. I'd said, basically the Santa Lama, okay, mate, it's your job to now help me become a Buddha. So show me how to do it, and I'm going to listen to you. I gave him permission. 
And then, then you give them permission to do all kinds of things. And, you know, and that's so for me from day one as well, and I feel very fortunate, you know, Lama never soft, soft, was never, I mean, he was soft, but he was, he was, in, and Lama's open, absolutely the same, were really intense in the way they would help me see my mind. They weren't, they didn't pussyfoot about around, you know. So it was, and that means, you know, like one time with uh, I was in France and then Annette was there and I wanted to see Rimache. He was there and I need, I need, I wanted a quick word with Rimache and I asked her and I was outside the door and then Annette walked in and said, Rimache, Rabin is outside. Can you have a meeting? And he ignored her. And so four times she said it and four times he ignored her. Well, so if, of course, if I hadn't checked up on Mama Zopa, if I hadn't got confidence that he was a valid person, if I didn't have confidence that as far as I was concerned, he was the Buddha, then I would have thought, well, who does he think he is? He can't be a valid Buddha and walk away, you know, because we're so fragile. So you're giving permission to the Lama to show you your mind, really, to help you develop your marvelous potential. And I mean, we, 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 when we trust a person, we don't mind what they do. I mean, I had a Kung Fu teacher. I used this as an example, Mr. Lee. The very first time I did karate, the very first time, it was a big lesson for me. Uh, very first time I did karate, before I met the Lamas, I remember because I was a feminist, I was living in New York, and because I was a feminist, I wanted a, I wanted a, a female te a teacher and a female dojo. So I chose one. And I was, it was very nice. I had a really good time there for that year. And my, my friends, I met these women, my friends, but the teacher wasn't very qualified. I didn't know that, though, because I hadn't checked. So then two years later, when I'm in Melbourne and I want to go to karate again, or a year and a half later, and, uh, and I, there wasn't any female dojo, so I found this male, a man, a teacher, a man who was teaching the same karate. And I, and I told him I was a red, a green belt or a brown belt, whatever I was. And in the same system. And he saw me after the first class and he came to me later and he said, I'm sorry, you got to go back to the beginning. You got to go back to the white belts. I remember feeling so offended because I thought I was more, I had more advanced than I really was, but I'd learned the wrong way, but I didn't know because I'd chosen the wrong teacher. And I learned that. And I was so proud and so upset when this fellow said I had to go back to the beginning again. But that was that was the first time I realized you need a teacher in anything. And me being so proud and so independent, you know. But I re and I wasn't going to go back, but I decided I would. And I trusted him because and that's when I realized you need a good teacher. So I didn't I didn't check on that first teacher. I had a good time. It was a nice time anyway. I learned a lot, but she wasn't a valid teacher, but I hadn't checked. That was when I realized you have to have a valid teacher. Because if you're going to put your heart to somebody, you're going to open up your heart, and we're already still full of attachment, and it's going to be it's going to be attachment there as well. You're going to listen to this person and you want their approval, but they're a peanut, then you're in big trouble, you know. I mean, karate is nothing for comparison. But of course, here we're talking about becoming enlightened on a spiritual path, and that from lifetime to lifetime. So this is a long-term commitment, I promise you. So we really better be confident. And then, of course, as we get more, as we get more um, involved in the teachings, and we start to think about emptiness and dependent arising, and you know, and we realize that um, we, you know, no, never mind all that. Never mind all that. So the importance of the teacher, I can't, you know, and, and the trouble is too, you know, when you hear Lama Zobarimche talking about it in, in, you know, in his medieval way. I mean, I joke about the Tibetans. They're more. I mean, the way they talk, it's very fascinating. It's all, I mean, they, 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 they're very fundamentalist how they talk, the way they talk, isn't it? It's very kind of shocking. I mean, you read Lama Zopa's, tea, read Lama Zopa's words. He's laughing and smiling with the greatest compassion you could imagine. But these heavy-duty words about going to the hell realms for 42 eons, if you blink this way, it kind of scares the life out of us, you know? We don't know what quite to do with it. But it's because it's just their style, the way of talking. I mean, Lama Yeshi never talked like that. He never mentioned the word. He hardly mentioned the word karma, you know, not to mention hell. Lama would crack jokes. So there's different ways, I think, <laughs> excuse me, different ways, you know, of um, hearing the teachings about having a guru, the meaning of a guru, the teacher, and all the advice is there. It's very detailed. But to try and put it in simple words is so important. And to realize we, you know, um, we need it in anything. We, I mean, anything we learn is obvious. It's obvious. The quickest way to learn it is to learn it from somebody who knows how to do it. It's so obvious. It's just that we don't frame it in those terms of guru devotion and blah, 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 you know. But it's so clear. And the fact is we need that because we need our heart to be lifted. We have a human heart, you know. And, we, and, and, and the other thing for me, this is where, you know, talking in a practical way, 
this idea of devotion. You know, when you when you like somebody, an ordinary person, or if you, especially if you're in love with somebody, I mean, your heart is wide, wide open, isn't it? Which means you're really devoted to that person. You listen to every word they say. You adore them. You want to be with them. Of course, it's driven by attachment, but there's a good side there. The heart is open. Well, your heart, but because attachment is there, and because your heart is open, and then you because you're so needy and ridiculous, and this person's a peanut anyway, then of course you're going to get hurt. Of course you will. So if you're going to be devoted to somebody, you'd better be clear and confident that they're a valid person to give your heart to. You better be, you know, give your heart, give your heart to somebody whom you can trust. I mean, this is, you know, this is huge. And then when your heart is open and you have a valid object of devotion, then it's very, very powerful for your mind, you know. And don't think of this as sort of holy. Anybody you see this, anybody who's really religious, who's who really loves God, a Christian or something, let's say a Christian, or a Muslim who is who loves God, who has got faith in God, that fills their mind and fills you and lifts you, you know. I'm not talking about fanatic and neurotic people. I'm talking about a person who just has this confidence in the presence of this powerful spiritual energy. And that's what we're talking about here in a simple way. So it's really clear we need, I mean, because we're so suffering, because we're so isolated and lonely because of attachment, to have a person you revere, you respect, you want to become like is very, very powerful for the mind. We, it lifts us. And then, But then the other one, of course, is you don't just sit there and wait for it to happen and you don't just sit there and they do all the work. You've got to do the work. And that means you've got to study and practice. So you know, the way, you know, they always talk about the best offering to the teacher is that you practice. And I'm sure it's true, you know, it's true with anybody. I mean, if you're a musician and you practice what your teacher told you, she's going to be so happy. You can give her a thousand dollars. She's not going to care. She might like, but she, if you practice what she's told you to do, she's only wanting to give you more. It's so clear. I could see that when I didn't win Kung Fu, Mr. Lee, my Kung Fu teacher. This is 10 years after my karate. When I did this time, I checked the teacher and I checked Mr. Lee. And Mr. Lee, I, I went to his kids' class, and I was really impressed by all these kids, you know. So I thought he was he he was valid. So I I did this is when I was a nun. Now this is ten years later, twenty three, thirty three, twenty years later, when I was about forty something. I can't remember ten years. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. I was living in London, working for wisdom, and I did I did kung fu. And of course, being fanatic, I did it every day. And I'd go to this kung fu class with, and, and I was there were three of us who were the fanatics. There was like this. 14-year-old boy, a 19-year-old boy, and me. I was like 42 and a nun. They didn't know I was a nun. I didn't wear my robes. But we were the three little, like the three musketeers. We went to every class six days a week. We'd go and then we'd go hang out in Chinatown in, in London and eat French fries at McDonald's, you know, afterwards because you wouldn't eat before. You had to want to have an empty stomach. And I was a fanatic. I trained six days a week, three hours a day. And I wanted, and so I could see with Mr. Lee, and this is the one about, you know, I, I did, I checked on his credentials. He was valid. So I wanted his approval. Of course you do. You die for someone's approval, especially if it's a teacher. You want them to approve of you. So they give you the instructions. If you do it, they're going to give you more instructions. So I went six days a week. So the man wasn't stupid. He could tell I wanted his Kung Fu. So he gave me his Kung Fu as much as possible. And of course he was incredibly tough with me. He'd scream at me, you know, and I was honored. I didn't want to go and sue Mr. Lee because he shouted at me. I was honored that he shouted at me because he could tell I wanted his Kung Fu. So he kept giving me his Kung Fu. It works. It's a, a very dynamic relationship. So it's clear with a teacher. And this is the interesting point. I didn't see Lama Sopa Lama Yeshi that often. I mean, I can count. I say it. I think it's probably true. I could count on two hands the number of personal meetings I had with both of them. You know, Really personal. I didn't have that. And you don't need and that's where, of course, this gets a bit more esoteric for us. But once I'd established this relationship with Lama Yeshi and then eventually Lama Zopa, um, and indeed my other teachers, you know, you can have as many as you like. The work, the work's all yours. They've done the job. They're Buddha. They don't need to do more from their side. But the, so the re, so the work has to be done by us. So that's where you get the benefit. Instead of thinking, oh, I want to have Lama Zopa see me, I've got to talk to Lama Zopa and have him stroke me and smile at me. You don't need that. I mean, the baby in you wants it, but you don't need that. Because if you do the practices, and especially, of course, because we have all these marvelous practices from the Vajjana, the visualization of these different, different Buddhas whom we see as the guru, it's totally, totally prepared for us that all the work is in that practice every day. And that's how you grow your guru devotion. And that's how you grow yourself.
You know, the more you practice, the more you're confident this person is valid, the more you see them as the Buddha, the more blessings you get. So it's a really integrated, delicious process, you know. So all the work has to be done by us. We don't need to be seen all the time by the teacher. And then, of course, because now we're talking more than Kung Fu and more than cooking, we're talking, you know, the mind being more subtle and and the deity appearing and manifesting and all these things. I mean, you know, we can it, it incredibly rich. The practice can be incredibly rich and incredibly satisfying for us to do the to do the practices, and that increases increases our relationship and our confidence in these people as being manifestations of the Buddha. You know. So I don't know. What do you think, people? Ask me some questions. Ask me some questions. If you'd like to. Anybody. Any question at all. Doesn't matter. Nothing? I have a question. Good, Carl. Talk to me. For us who are new on the path but are sincerely devoted and have come a long way to Asia, I know you, might, you must have had a lot of new westerners with faith in the buddha dharma yes. sangha yes uh, so how how did you find your your first guru and 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 how did you as an australian um, maneuver this thank you okay i sort of been talking about that and i'll so i'll keep talking so okay yeah i mean as I, as I, as i mentioned i met the, i met lama yeshi and lama zopa first it wasn't in asia it was in australia and uh, that's what I was talking about. That's what I've been talking about already. That I met them in uh, at Chen Raising Institute. And um, did you? Sorry, let you me been... clarify. Let me let me yeah. clarify. No, Sorry. Yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, so, please. So, so for us who are looking for a guru, how do we go about finding one? Oh, I see. That's I know. I understand. Thank you so much. Okay, that's a really important question. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way, much of what I've been saying is sort of uh, is is the answer. But one way of saying it is this. If you, you have to first know. Okay, I, okay, I'll give you my example. This is, I always use this example of when I first learned to make a cake. And it's really the same process. And this is the same process, Carl. So I remember, and I, I like to use ordinary examples because we, instead of mystifying the guru one, because it's the same with all the things we have to learn. And I, so my mother, I learned how to make a cake for my mother and I was about 25 or 26 when I first learned. And this is my, my point now. My first answer to you is you have to know what you want. So I had to know I wanted to make a cake. And that thought never had arisen in my mind till I was about 25 or 26, for whatever reason. I joke about it. I was in London. I was a hippie. And I had the thought I wanted to make a carrot cake. So then that was the first thing. So from that moment, then in a sense, I started doing the search. I wanted to make a cake. So then I was going back home to Melbourne and I was going to see my mum. And I knew she was a good cake maker. I would tasted her cakes all my life. But I'd never wanted to learn, so I'd never asked her. And the interesting point was she never tried to show me because she knew I'd not listen. So, but the, from the moment I knew I wanted to make a cake, everything started to open up. So that's then, then I decided I would ask my mother. So this is the point. I wanted it first. So then obviously I'd done my market research. I'd done my due diligence. This is the next step to do. You check, you go to the classes, you check the teachers, you know, you go to this one, you go to that one. I mean, in my case with, with Dharma, I fell straight into the lap of these llamas. They were my first classes. Do you understand? So the cake one example, because I knew I wanted to make a cake, then I thought, oh, I'll ask my mum because I'd done my market research. And what does that mean? I checked the product, the teachings. I checked her qualities. I checked her disciples, my sisters. I'd eaten their cakes. I checked her peers. Her friend said she was a good cake maker. And this is the point, Carl. Why did I have to do my due diligence like that? Because, because I had no experience in making cakes. It's a very powerful point. I had no reference point. I had no way of judging that if any old Joe showed me how to make a cake, I'd have no way of judging whether that was correct. And that's exactly what happened with my first karate teacher. I hadn't checked up on their reputation. I hadn't checked up on their teacher. I hadn't, I didn't know whether they were a good teacher or not. So for one year I learned and I didn't ever know it was wrong. So you got to, the only way we can have confidence in a teacher 
because you don't have experiential confidence, you've got to have inferential certainty. They call it that. It's intellectual confidence by checking on their quality, checking what they're like, going to hear them, checking the student, checking their peers, checking their reputation, because you have nothing else to, to rely upon. And I had done that with my mother. So I was ready. I wanted it. She knew how to do it. And I said, Mum, please show me how to make a cake. And you know what, Carl? I remember the day it wasn't a carrot cake. It was an apple and walnut cake. But it's in my mind, in a memory. It's there as a picture. The kitchen, the day. It's clear to me because that's the first time cakes became real for me. No, Lami Yeshi for me it was the first time the Dharma became real for me. So so you 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 got to know you want it, and then you kind of you don't just physically search. I remember one person, her one student, her mother was literally want, wanted her teacher, and she went she had, she could afford it, went around the world literally searching for teachers. And eventually, one day, she met her root guru, and he said, "Where have you been all this time?" Sort of like that, you know. So if you, for, the other thing is, if you have any confidence in the teachings, and you have confidence in the teachings about karma, which means why it even would arise in your mind, even the thought, how oh, I wouldn't mind to listen, you know, to listen to some Buddha's teachings. It's only because you've done it before. Why you even have the thought to want to kill somebody is you've done it before. Why anything arises in your mind, it is that you've done it before. So be glad that if it is the Dharma that you're looking for and you are, a, you know, it's con you're connecting with it, you're recognizing it. It didn't just fall into your, it didn't, I mean, with me, like Lama Yeshi, it seemed like he fell in my lap, my very first teaching, but karma took care. Karma was so strong, you know, I stopped in my tracks doing my karate, the timing was right, this is how karma works, it's the timing has to be right, and then I saw that poster, and I went to the classes, and it all fell into place. So it seemed like serendipity, it seemed like just good luck, but no. So if you, so then, so the external one is important, go to the classes, go to the teachers, listen, but the internal is the main one, Carl, want it from your heart every day, because every thought you have, as Lama Zopa says, everything exists on the tip of the wish, the thought I want. So have every thought, the thought, every day, the thought, I want to find my teachers, I want to find my path, may I find my path, may I recognize, every day have that, and that will drive you, and then use your common sense, use your noggin, use your intelligence, and then one day you will, it will come, logically. All right? Metta, thank you. Wonderful good. answer. Good, 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 good. Thank you. Hello there, Zara. Talk to me. Yes, thank you, Venerable Rubina. Okay. Um, Venerable, having heard lately of a person around my age with a terminal illness and not long to go, it got me thinking about, even for those of us who practice the Dharma, we do our daily practices, how do you convince yourself that you, what you're doing is a virtuous and meaningful life without kidding yourself? Now, it's a really good question because, you know, so this is why, okay, it's a really good question, Zara. So um, the, the way to give us a ground in the understanding, in the answer to that question, you have to know the Buddhist view of the mind. So that when we learn the Buddhist view of the mind, not just doing our practices and everything, but studying, and, the, and again, we've got to really realize the Buddhist view of the mind is unbelievably kind of the way it's, uh, uh, in the in the, in the literature, how it's been taught over the centuries, coming from these genius, as we all know, you genius Indians, well before the Buddha, as the Dalai Lama says, the, was these genius Indians more than three thousand years ago, who were the ones who began the investigation to the nature of self. So there's an incredible body of knowledge starting there, and then from Buddha, and then he diverged in his own direction, and all the time since then, in all the different cultures, unbelievable literature detailed, detailed descriptions of what the mind is, of how it functions, of the contents of the mind. It's incredibly sophisticated knowledge. So the essence of it is this. The essence of it is when you understand that as far as the Buddha is concerned, there are three categories of states of mind in all of us. And animals and humans and hell beings, we're all the same. There are deluded, neurotic, eye-based, fear-based, distorted, afflicted states of mind. There are the valid, reasonable, useful states of mind. So the first lot, attachment, anger, jealousy, low self-esteem, arrogance. The second lot, love, compassion, kindness. These words are so simple, but the difference between them is utterly profound. And this is not how we think in modern psychology. You know, we give equal status to all of these states of mind and sort of we mix them all up in a big jumble in a big soup inside us. So the key thing is even knowing intellectually the crucial job of a Buddhist is to distinguish between these in our mind. So I think in modern psychology, in the sciences in the modern world, psychology is sort of on the bottom, is the bottom of the totem pole. 
control because we don't trust the mind. We don't. We just think it's chaotic and subjective. And indeed, your question: How can you know? So, but the Buddha's view is that the mind is incredible. It can be. It, it's. It's. We've got the potential to develop this clarity and wisdom that is enabling us to do the actual job of being a Buddhist, which is distinguishing between the delusions and the virtues. This is the job of being a Buddhist, Zara. We do our practices and our prostrations and our water bowls and our devotional practices. These are the practices that enable us to do the actual job of being a Buddhist, which is exactly that one, to have the wisdom, to develop the wisdom and clarity and the good motivation and your virtues in order to then enable you to identify the neuroses and be able to then make wise, skillful judgments and know and know that you can learn to do the right thing and identify it. That's the job of being a Buddhist. It's the job. So you have to first know that intellectually that you've got to distinguish between attachment. So why we, we you know, we can fool ourselves is because we have attachment. Oh, I'm, you know, we, we can believe anything. We'll believe anything or do anything. If, if we are attached to a person and then attachment completely throws us and makes us not able to know what's going on. But if we develop have good practice, we develop some concentration, we know the model of the mind, we know the definition of attachment, we know the definition of anger, we know the definition of arrogance, we know the definition of love and compassion, and then you observe them in your mind, you've got this wisdom that you develop that enables you to deserve them in your mind, and then you can learn to distinguish. And you can then, and then based on your mind training every day, Day, setting your pure motivation every day you're training your mind you're really just doing this incredible training and this is the job that you're going to be doing so it's absolutely possible but you've got to do it properly does that make sense zara you've just yes thanks very much thank you thank you so much but it's possible that's the point it's not just cross your fingers and hope for the best it just comes from good hard work and then we need courage to do that, Zara, because we can easily fool ourselves. And we, we, we'd rather, sometimes we're lazy. We've got to have courage to want to be authentic and want to be clear and want to have the right motivation. And then that, that helps us grow this wisdom. Do you understand, Zara? Good, darling. I do, I do. Thank you. I do. Amit, Thank you very then. much. Good, good evening, Amit. Happy to see you again. Thank you, Venerable. So good to oh. see you again. Happy yes. Rosa. Oh. Um, yes. my, my question is, I don't have a guru, but I am learning a lot from multiple people. So I'm inspired. What did you say? I don't have what? I missed your first sentence. I don't have one. I, I do not have one guru. Okay, fine. Yes. But I learn from a lot of people. So I'm yes. inspired by the prime minister of my country, for example. I'm inspired by people in the financial services because I'm a financial yes. advisor. I'm inspired right, exactly. by teachers like you. I'm inspired yes. by the Dalai Lama. So... That's I'm right. also inspired by people who are doing a good job in, in the space yes. of well-being and psychology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So right. if I am trying to take best from a set of people rather than one person, uh -huh. is that living a less virtuous life? What was that last living? What was the first what was the, the last question? So if instead of having one guru, if yeah. I'm living yeah. from a set of people, a bunch of people. Yes. Yes, it's that yes. living a less virtuous life. Well, I mean, I don't know whether that's the doing that. I don't know whether that's a conclusion. That's even be a, even a question. It's got nothing to do with that. It's more to do with right back to what I said to Carl. You have to know what you want. You have to know what you want, and no one's saying what you need to want. You don't have to want to be the best tennis player on the planet. You don't have to want that, but if you do want that, but necessarily you will yeah. go to the various teachers and it'll keep narrowing down and narrowing down and narrowing and down until you've found the one teacher that's right for you because you because when it, you go deep, 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 deep into tennis, every tiny action counts. One teacher will say you hold the racket with this finger that way. The other teacher will hold the racket this way. You can't do both. So if you... On the surface, you can learn so much from so many people, and that does not not mean it's a, a lesser life. But if you, it's up to what your mind is like and what you want. So if, you, if it becomes something for you that you know you want this more, you'll end up. So for me, it just fell that way. I fell into the lap of a Tibetan Buddhist teacher, not just Tibetan Buddhist, but Galupa, not just Galupa, but Lama Yeshi. It became very specific. So then from there, I practice, and now I can have fifty-seven teachers. So it kind of it doesn't contradict. But in the end, to do something really. I mean, to go to intricate detail into any one thing in any area, it, it narrows it down. It narrows it down. So I'm not saying you have to do that, but just 
keep moving. And then the answer to the question is, what do you want? So if you want a valid, good life, if you want to be moral, if you want to have, you know, you need to find people who can reflect that back to you. And it's driven by what you want. Do you understand? Yeah, thank you. Good. Good, Amit. Hello, Dinara. Hello, Hello, Venerable. Happy to see you. Uh, happy to see you too. Uh, I have a question. Can you please talk a little bit about uh, the importance of, be of humbleness and how, how to stay humble? Uh, humility. Yeah, no, it's, fan it's a very good question. And this is where we, we study the mind. Mm -hmm. We study the Buddhist view of the mind. We're going to learn, there. Are, you know, there's one delusion, a particular delusion, a particular affliction. We're all very familiar with it. It's called pride or arrogance, whichever one you like. They're pretty much the same. So when we understand the essential quality, the central characteristic of the neurotic states of mind is that they are eye-based, fear-based, and they're distorted. They're not, they're, they're exaggerations. They all exaggerate something. And the key quality of the virtuous states of mind and the opposite of arrogance would be humility is they don't exaggerate and they're more rooted in not just I, they're not I obsessed. So arrogance, so okay, attachment exaggerates the nice qualities of something. If you're attached to cake, it'll look more delicious than it really is. If you have aversion to somebody, they appear more ugly than they really are. Well, arrogance is very clear, or pride. It over-exaggerates our importance. The flip side of it is low self-esteem, which is over-exaggerating your, your, your lack of importance. Do you understand? And they're very, very connected. And our problem in our life, when we hear about humility, we mistake it for low self-esteem. We think humility means, oh, I shouldn't like myself. But humility is a valid state of mind. And the interesting point is the irony of a, of a, of a low self-esteem person who is obsessed with themselves, it's just the flip side of arrogance. And really, you only got low self-esteem because you've got arrogance. Whereas if you've got humility, you are content with who you are, you're satisfied with it, and you're happy to praise other people. A low self-esteem person, when they see another person who's better than they are, they kind of take it personally as a personal insult against them. Because we actually, it's 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 the flip side of arrogance, and it's not comfortable. But humility is relaxed and easygoing. So a humble person can praise another person, but a humble person also has confidence, has self confidence. So we've really got to again the 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 way to understand what I'm saying is all rooted in this very clear way Buddhism presents the different categories of states of mind. The negative ones are distorted, they're eye-based, they exaggerate, and they they cause suffering. The virtues are relaxed, easygoing, spacious, and cause happiness. And they're very different. And we, ha we have to know that theoretically, but then only by looking into our minds every day, we can begin to actually identify the difference. So humility is a hugely important quality for one's own benefit. And it's not low self-esteem. It's not, oh, I'm nothing and there's something. That's just, that's a neurotic idea. Do you understand what I'm saying, Dinara? Does it make sense what I'm saying? Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Because I think our, the, 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 another question, another way to frame your question is what's the, what's the disadvantage of being arrogant? Well, first, we've got to recognize we're arrogant and we don't like to recognize that. But, and I want to say this more again. If we've got low self-esteem, which everybody would confess to, it's because we're arrogant. And this is very shocking to hear. It's very shocking. So with arrogance, it doesn't, it's, none of the negative states of mind are comfortable. They're very painful. They've, you feel very fragile. So an arrogant person is desperately wanting other people to see that they're important, you know, and, they, and you feel like all puffed up, but it's not comfortable. It's not nice. And the minute a person doesn't respect you, you get so wounded, so offended, and that's when it turns into low self-esteem. So they're really unhappy states of mind and you'll never get anywhere. So the, and the key disadvantage of arrogance, of course, is because you think you know everything. So you're not going to listen to anybody. You can't you can't hear anything. I mean, they always say with the teachings, when you're listening to the teachings and, you, you know, if you've got a sense, well, <clears throat> I know this already, I'm going to hear a single word. Whereas humility, it's got much more space in it. It's much more comfortable. And humility is you, you can 
you you want to learn more and you know you need to learn more but interestingly humility is also coming with some self-confidence because it's a virtuous state of mind all the virtuous states of mind are comfortable and reasonable and are healthy mentally they're healthy states of mind the delusions are very unhealthy states of mind are we communicating Janara? And all of this, these we can learn the theories, but we have to learn to become intimately familiar with the workings of all these states of mind because they're all in there. We've got all of them. We've got all of them, you know. <laughs> so what else, people? Anything else? Is that Did Karina put her hand up? No? You didn't, Karina. Okay. I thought I'd see your hand up. No, don't worry. Who else? Ask me some questions. Any old questions? Come on. Please, anything. Yes, SK. Who is SK? Hello. Talk to me. Yeah. So just go, you know, uh, going ahead with what uh, Dinara was mentioning. Uh, yes. Over the years, as uh, you know, uh, practicing and you know, uh, realizing that every moment, you know, contemplating on you know every phenomena and every person I meet is dependent, originated, and causes and conditions. But when you come across people, uh, there is always this at the back of the mind that you know. Mm, there's a judgment coming up and uh, that awareness that I'm always judging people. Yes, even right, though, exactly. Even though at the background, there's a wisdom that they are That's behaving right. in whichever way, uh, in the nasty way or, you know, violent way, aggressive way, uh, because right. of a lot of causes and conditions. Right. But That's I right. also have this kind of uh, thing coming that on this spiritual path, uh, why am I uh, judging everyone? I mean, I understand. That's a very good yeah. It's a really good point, SK, and I think everybody does that. It's the commonest thing we have that um, when we're caught up in the delusions, we're always, first, we're always finding fault. So this is why when we see our minds very uncontrolled, they're always finding fault. They're always critical and about ourselves. They're always negative. They're always the negative side, always finding fault. I'm not good enough. I'm too fat. I'm this. I'm that. Someone says the wrong word. Oh, I must have done the wrong thing. I'm bad. We never are uncontrolled with our positive thoughts. It's always just the negative thoughts. And negative thoughts are always finding fault. So it's inevitable because we have this sense of a concrete I that is literally separate from others, which is the, the, the result of ego grasping, the root delusion. And then because we have attachment, strong attachment to be approved of and loved by other people. And then we can't we have, and then we're never satisfied. And then we're all, so because of attachment, we're never satisfied. So when we see other things out there, we're looking for something nice, but we're always just, it's inevitable. We're always separating ourselves from others and always finding, you're absolutely right, finding fault, acting as if I'm perfect and look at all those people out there. So it's it's a very strong impulse. It really is true. So i am found, you see, the, the what you just said is very good. You see, well, they're acting that way because of karma due to causes and conditions. But the other thing that I find very powerful about when you look at the outside world and, you know, we have this nice analogy. There's the wisdom wing and the compassion wing. And the compassion wing, that's the more advanced one. But the wisdom wing has to come first, which means the nuts and bolts of knowing the mind, doing like you're talking like you're talking, understanding yourself, what is going on in your mind. And then you look at the outside world because we're living in it. We can't avoid it. We don't just leap to compassion, but an extra component after you think, well, there's a bad person due to karma. But the really powerful teaching is, you, you say, I recognize that. Thank you for showing me how not to be. Because everything you see in everybody, if we realize the Buddhist view of the mind, everyone is the same. This is the Buddhist view. There's all the delusions and then there are the virtues. So there's, you know, you look at that worst politician on the planet, that evil person, and you see there's anger, there's, there's arrogance, there's violence, there's jealousy. You know you've got those. So not just, oh, look at the acting this way due to karma, but then you say, I recognize that. Thank you for showing me how not to be. So it becomes a teaching for you, for your mind, because there's not a single delusion in them that isn't in your mind to one degree or another. Then it becomes very personal and becomes it goes back to practice. Thank you for showing me how not to be. I recognize that. And then thank you for showing me how not to be. Then you can add the compassion afterwards do you understand and so, it, so instead of because what happens when we start finding fault then we freak out then we get depressed the world's so ugly it's a disaster what to do and we want to run away but this way it makes you courageous 
and makes everything in the world grist for your mill for your practice. Thank you. you I recognize that. Say that. And it's, it brings it right back to you. And then you keep thinking, I'm going to continue to practice. But it's just, it's just the nature of ego. It's the irony of ego that we find we're dissatisfied. We find fault. It's just how the mind is. It's just how delusions are. Do you understand? Right. right. And the more you study the mind, the more it, you can, it makes sense. This is the way the mind is, you know. Do you understand? SK. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. Hello, Demetrius. Talk to me. Hello. Yes. Um, so right now I'm in a, I feel very unemployed and I'm unemployed. <laughs> yes. What do you mean unemployed? Uh, I don't have a, I, I, I find it difficult to find a job right now. And okay. I just recently I broke up with a person. Oh my goodness. So that's... Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Everything. Wow. So How you yeah. Yeah, I'm, um, I have ups and downs. Yes. Right now, I feel anger. Yes, as a person. And I find very person. difficult. Yes, sorry. You're angry with the person who gave you up or angry that you have no job or both? <sighs> yeah. I find it difficult to understand what am I angry for. I and understand. Go on. Yeah. I find it difficult to find love for myself right now i understand i understand demetrius i understand sweetheart so listen um this is the thing you know attachment and anger these two primordially deep states of mind that are who that are the source of our pain and the cause of all the other neuroses you know these are the root ones in day-to-day -day life and they don't necessarily need to have you know when you say i don't know why i'm angry this is really that's very reasonable because it just means what's happened, broadly speaking, you see, broadly speaking, when we understand the mind, we will understand that anger is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. You disappear. Can you hear that concept? That anger, you see, what we're driven by, Demetrius, this, as we know from the Buddha's teachings, we're driven by this deep in our bones. It's just automatic. It's primordially deep. It's this constant hunger for the nice things, to get nice sounds and nice smells and nice people and nice jobs, to get, in other words, we're driven by this emotional hunger, this is attachment, to get what I want. The I is the is the driving force, you know? So attachment is this hunger to get what I want. So right, so then when attachment doesn't get what it wants, instantly it arises as aversion and that's anger. So that's natural. It's inevitable. You just a thousand times a day, this will happen. But when things, ha you, you can't get a job, someone's rejected you or your relationship broke up. So your attachment has suddenly been punched in the nose. So of course, it's not getting what it wants. And so then the frustration and the aversion and the anger and the dissatisfaction are very strong. So you just have to notice it, but don't turn it against yourself. Do not do that. Don't then have another voice in your head criticizing yourself because of this, you know, and which is what we tend to do. The irony of ego is we turn it all against ourselves. And don't do that. Try not to do that. Try to protect your mind and try to just to have courage to know that, you know, the Buddhist view is very strongly that the virtuous states of mind, love and compassion and confidence and self-confidence, these are our true nature. But the other stuff, they're there, but and they're the ones that cause us pain. So when you're in a difficult time like now, you've got to be very cautious and careful to protect your thoughts and try not to let your mind go completely crazy. I mean, we can't stop the thoughts because they're so strong, but have some wisdom inside you that is kind of like going, it's okay, Demetrius, I'm having all this anger now but this is not who I really am this is not my true nature these qualities don't define me and you just kind of hold yourself steady and you just try to have confidence and just keep moving every day a little bit every day every day do you have a practice do you do some kind of practice or not what are you a buddhist or not a buddhist I'm just curious I'm not saying you should be no yeah I'm um, meditating often okay well then, darling, just to try just to take care of yourself. Try to watch your thoughts. Don't let them get it. Try not to let you can't force them to go away. We know that. And but you can at least have the con you can at least talk to yourself and say, 
these thoughts are loud, this anger is strong, but it's not my real nature. Don't, in other words, don't define yourself in terms of the anger. Don't don't believe all the thoughts that you're thinking. That's the, that's the big practice. Let the thoughts come and go. You can't stop them, but don't believe their story. Don't believe that you're a creep. Don't believe that you know what you're thinking because this is what ego does. Just be careful. Be cautious. Protect your thoughts. Protect yourself. But don't try to force them away. But just mm -hmm. don't believe them. That's a really important step. And then it's, that's why it's important if you do like a spiritual practice. The Buddhist teachings are very encouraging. Lama Yeshi was like this. He would really read. He would. Um, he really constantly encourage us to see to see our potential. The mind has incredible potential. That, it's, that the delusions and anger are not at the core of our being. They don't define us. I mean, do you like to read the Dharma books? Yeah. Well, read Lama Yeshi's book, Mahamudra. Get that. Mm -hmm. You can get that on digital. Mahamudra, Lama Yeshi. It's very, he's very inspiring about our potential. He's very inspiring. And he talks about meditation. He's very wonderful. That will lift your, he'll lift your heart. Do you understand, sweetheart? Yes. Good. Good, darling. Good, Jimmy. Thank you. Keep moving. Thank Don't you. give up, okay? Thank you. Hello, Jitandali. Talk to me. Venerable. Hi. Um, uh, there are these uh, two thought processes that uh, I have which are quite contradictory uh, to one another. Um, in and I, I'm not sure how to balance between the two. Uh, the first one is uh, the feeling of compassion towards everybody, including um, people who are, uh, including criminals, for example, or people who got negative virtues or people in jail or people who wronged me, who hurt me. So, That's right, exactly. So uh, I always try to think of what um, what could have happened in their life or their past karma. That's right. Which yes, did what they did, and then I I start to feel compassion for them. Good, amazing. So then, uh, the, other one... in, the other one is, and this has been uh, from my childhood. Um, it's sort of in my mind, looking at people's greed and uh, their cruelty towards sentient beings, towards animals, um, hurting others, hurting people, hurting animals. So the feeling is, I hate people. I hate human beings for everything that they do so it's just it's very confusing sometimes it gets very confusing how do i reconcile um i understand sweetheart and it's just very fascinating because you gave a good analysis of compassion and you gave a good analysis of anger i mean do they come at the same time do they come in relation to the same person i mean give an example like you just read let's say you read about some or you, or was it people you know? I mean, or was it? It's no, no. Uh, so I, I, um, I love animals, and uh, I work as much as possible for their welfare. And um, then I see anim animal cruelty. Um, okay. So okay. So okay. So what you're saying? Okay. Now I hear a bit. So okay. So then you see the animal who's suffered. So on the one hand, you read about murderers and criminals and you can have compassion. But it seems to me as soon as you see that an animal has suffered, then you get mad at the person who did it. Is that right? Mad at not just the person, but this, but but the world. <laughs> just what do you mean by the mad, world? Mad at humanity. Uh, mad why I am a human being, why I'm, I am part of this whole process, how I'm perpetrating cruelty as well through my ways. Being okay, I mean, I, okay, good. I mean, it's all, it all seems good in a way, what you're doing. You're using your analysis. But it's like, do you have, I mean, do you have, what are your answers to these things? Do you have the Buddhist view? I'm not saying you should. Do, is the Buddhist view your view of the world or not? I'm not saying you should have. I'm just curious. Do you I, have answers to why the world is this way? Because so, that's, the, that's the point. So I, in fact, I feel that the Buddhist view sort of protects my sanity. Okay, but then the Buddha, all I'm, if that's the case, then all I'm saying, okay, let me talk like this. Okay, so listen, if you just say you see a whole lot of people who are all sick and they're all obese, 
because you know so on the one hand you have compassion for them because they're suffering but on the other hand you know you 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 don't you no listen I'm, no I'm, okay what i'm trying to get at sorry start again if you in any experience if you don't have an analysis of why something is the way it is then you're just confused and emotional so if you don't if you can apply the view of karma because the karmic just like just like she said before i mean um gitanjali she just said no you're gitanjali so somebody else who just spoke, who just spoke to who it was i can't remember i can't remember but when we just had the conversation now when you know why people behave the way they behave, which is the view of karma, when you understand the law of karma, and I don't just mean know the word karma, but really have the analysis, then, then you know why a person does something, you won't get angry. But anger is just like fear and panic. And oh my God, humanity, we're a disaster because you don't have an analysis. So you need to apply more of an analysis for why people do what they do. Because the interesting point is the Bodhisattva view, when we really understand karma and we really have compassion, we have the most compassion for the people who do the harm because they are not only harming others, but because they're harming others, they're harming themselves. And that's the basis of real compassion. When you see somebody harming an animal, due to first you have to have the view of karma that animal whom you have compassion for right now was the harmer in the past they created the cause by their past harming to be born as a dog and to be abused now and then the person harming them now will be exactly that in the future if you have that view of karma you have compassion for everybody rather than fear and anger but that's up to you you don't have to be forced to have the buddhist view because if you don't have an analysis of why things are the way we are, they are, that's why we get so much panic and fear and extreme and people are so emotional. We're out of, like, it's all out of control. The world, humanity, oh my God. So you've got a very good, you've got a lot of compassion and you have a big heart. So you just have to learn to use your intelligence to have an analysis to explain why. What is it about these? I mean, you know, you say you have a compassion for animals. Sometimes with human beings, with respect to you now, we can get a, bit, a, a lot of attachment involved, like animals are innocent. But animals have been harmers in the past. How the hell do you think they'd become animals if they didn't create the cause? That's Buddha's view. It's not just good luck and bad luck. There's no creator as far as Buddha's concerned. We all become in this life the person we become and have experiences that we have because of our own setting it up. We all create our own causes. We are all the creator of our own lives. So when you know that, you only have compassion for everybody but instead of having this, I mean, a lot of people have, we like to have an innocent victim and we love, we think animals are innocent victims. So we have this very emotional compassion for them, like as if they're innocent, but nobody's innocent. If you have the view of karma, we all created the cause from countless lifetimes doing harm to others, lying and stealing and harming. And then we experience the fruits of it later. I mean, that's just the Buddha's view. That's up to you to do what you'd like with it because that gives you a bigger view and calms your mind down and then you know why you are the way you are. You know why the dog is the way it is. You know why the harmer of the dog is doing what they're doing and then you have compassion for everybody. What do you think? What do you think of that? Yeah, it um, it, it makes what? sense. It makes sense to me, but it, it, it's it's hard it's hard to well, darling, there you go it makes sense but it's hard it's just sort of, it's sort of like when you learn something complicated of course it's hard but if it makes sense to you keep practicing it and slowly slowly sanity will come slowly slowly the the, the theories will become experiential for you and it will it will it will enable you to change your mind it's hard work darling of course it's hard work can't force it this takes time but it's it's helpful oh, how you put it. Thank you very much. Well, and, and I mean, just it's up to you. You know, you ought to keep trying to, and try. Oh, see, the other one is try and control your thoughts, because when you something or small will happen, and then you start the story in your head, and you think out. Oh my God, human beings! Try and control all your thoughts. Try to let them run away. Do you understand by, what I mean by that? Yeah, I do. And do what you can to be useful to others and keep practicing and keep having confidence. 
that, the, that there is a way to get clarity. There is clarity to come. And just be patient and be humble and keep working on yourself and helping others and know that clarity will come. Do you understand, sweetheart? I understand. Thank you. Good. Good, good, good. Hello, Sophie. Yes, Sophie. Hi, Venerable Ravina. Um, yes. Yeah, I was having a question regarding personal practice when you don't have a proper guru who, who can guide you. I did November course with you, so I have a lot of recordings and I keep listening to some teachings. But sometimes yeah. I com I'm confused about what should I practice? Should I do? So I well, alternate. You, you people, but do you have teachers you like? You should contact them and ask them. Okay. <laughs> you have teachers you like, Sophie? Yeah, I mean... I like you for sure. I did. I did well, really enjoy the November should, course. Why don't you get my email? Email me, and I'll answer okay. your question. Okay. Have you got my email address? Oh, uh, I no, I don't have it actually. It's my full name, Rabina Corton. Uh -huh. At Mac, like the computer at mac dot com. Mac. Mac dot com. Okay. Yeah, like the computer. So please, I'm happy to answer. I mean, but that's not saying you have to answer me. But if you want my answer, I'm happy to give it. Yeah, but I would that's be happy actually. Shows, yeah. Very welcome, mm -hmm. darling. You do Thank that. Thank you. All right, sweetheart. Hello, Janara. Again, Andrea. Hello, Andrea. You talk to me. Andrea. Hello, Hi, sweetheart. Venerable Rina. How are you? Happy yes. Losar. You too, darling. Thank you so much for this teaching. Um, and I just had a, a question kind of following on a lot about your talks about humility and that I feel like yeah. I'm starting to... to I've been studying a lot of karma right now and, and it gave me a more relaxed mind for a little bit. It was like, okay, we don't really have control. Karma, like all, all the causes and conditions have brought us here and we're still controlled a lot by our affliction. So kind of just try to stay present and keep your mind in virtue, like try to not be too self-critical. But yes, now yes. that I've practiced it for a bit, I feel tight again. And uh, I feel like... For example, today I have the choice of going to a wedding or or staying here and listening to teachings and kind of studying. And it's back to that bit of like, you do have to make a decision and kind of what, what decision is best for. Oh, okay. No, I think I, I like, I, I see what you're saying. And that but, that, but you're right. You have to, you can't just float along as if that somehow, sometimes it's true. Sometimes you just do, you get up in the morning, you do your practice and whatever happens, happens and you let it pass and let it go. But we have to make decisions. Of course we do. And so, but you got to look at why it is, it's difficult for you. Why is it tight for you to make a decision? I think it's tight because I do have, I observe this tendency of obsession in my head and I've started to obsess about Bodhicitta, <laughs> like obsessed okay, about. Yeah, the same, yeah, I know that's really the same as what I was saying before. You got a really, we we've got a very busy mind and a very, and you've obviously got a good mind. Like the was I was saying before, a lot of compassion. We can get very carried away. Try and just cut the thoughts. Just don't go there. Don't write novels every day. You go nuts if you do. You know, just try and keep it grounded. And so the basic idea is what choices to make. You know, it's not complicated. It's it's sort of just like knowing the theory. So really, if you've got a choice between, the, you know, let's say the wedding and something, you think, well, whatever's most beneficial. I want to do whatever's most beneficial. And it might well be the best thing to do to go to the wedding, go to the person who's there, even if you don't want to go, maybe because it just seems a right thing to do. So you don't get too caught up in it. Whatever's most beneficial. So you might go, to, you might just say, yes, I'll go to the wedding. But on the other hand, it might just be a waste of time. So you just got to know, I want to do what's most beneficial. Start with that thought. May I do what's most beneficial? And that'll train you to then eventually, without too much effort, to be able to see what's most beneficial. It mightn't be the most evident thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got to start with, I want to do what's most beneficial. That's really what bodhicitta is, because that's what it is. I want to do what's most beneficial. That's got to be your start. As the Dalai Lama says, always aspire to do what's most beneficial. And that's got to be your starting point. You've got a choice between this and that. You know, just go see your girlfriend or go go there. Whatever's most beneficial. And you begin then to get a sense of, and that the bodhicitta one is what's best for the other person. That's what sometimes is what's best for the other person. So it might be best for the other person that you go to the wedding. But it might, on the other hand, it might not be, and it might be best for you to stay. So you just, and you've got to tra train yourself in that. So start with that thought, as His Holiness says, always aspire to do what's most beneficial. And it's like anything, you train. As she said before, it's difficult. Of course it's difficult, but you've got to train yourself. My, this is a really intensive job we're discussing here of training our mind to think 
the, the, in the right direction. It's a huge job, but that's what we're capable of. So aspire to do what's most beneficial. And don't go on about it. Don't write novels. <laughs> what do you think? Thank you so much. Don't get carried but... away. We get carried away sometimes and we lose the plot, you know. Just bring it down to earth, whatever's the most beneficial. You know, and it could be the most simple thing to go out for lunch with a friend. Is it beneficial? No, you might just realise it's just wasting time. No, sorry, sweetheart, I can't do it today. And might, Or it might be they might need to talk to you and you may be busy, but you decide, yes, it's beneficial. You'll do it for their sake. Sometimes it's for their sake and sometimes it's better for your sake. You've got to work it out. But it comes, but always may I do what's most beneficial. And then, of course, there's this holding that says long-term, better than short-term, if you can. Mm -hmm. So tra you're training. This is mind training and it's a full-on job, okay? So keep moving, Beautiful. babe. Good. Thank you so All much. Right. Well, okay. Happy Hello, Adil Adil Talk to me. What time is it? Ten to ten. Go talk. You have to unmute. I can't hear you, my dear. Unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. There Sorry. we go. Thank Hi, good evening. Thank you. Good Happy evening. to see you. Happy yes. to see you. Well, my question is: I understand that spirituality is an individual process. Yes. Uh, but it's is it like two people in love? Can they walk the process together? Say that again. You want what? Can two people in love walk the process, yes. walk the path of okay. spirituality together? Of course you can, but it's a. Of course you can, but it's a. As you know, it's a minefield. So I mean, if you're asking from the perspective of, you know, I haven't got a person yet, and I would like to find one. Is that what you're suggesting? You'd like to find a partner with whom you can practice a spiritual path. Is that what you're saying, or you've already got a partner? No, I'm not that? saying anything. I'm just asking the question. Is it possible? Okay. Of course it's possible, but it's a minefield because if, as you say, in love means there's masses of attachment. And the, and, the, and the problem when we have a relationship, an attachment relationship, because we're so kind of linked to the other person, we um, can easily become a danger. You know, well, I'm practicing my spiritual path and I hope you're practicing your spiritual path too. You've got to want to practice your spiritual path with that person, even if they ended up not practicing. But if you do it contingent upon, oh, I will practice my spiritual path as long as you practice your spiritual path, then it becomes a problem. So yeah, you've that's... got to have a will, a wish to do it no matter what. But it can for sure. Many couples have some karmic connection as a result of their dharma and have a relationship and practice. But practice is individual. And then your practice when it comes to the other person, that's called practicing patience, practicing humility, practicing kindness. That's what. That's what, how you practice in relation to the other person. Do you understand? But if you've got your own personal practice on your cushion and then you practice humility and compassion to the other person, it'll work perfectly. Of course it's possible. Well, thank you. you understand? Yeah. I got Good. You. All right. So what else, dearest people? What else? Mahesh. Yes, talk to me. Hello. Unmute, my dear. Yeah. Happy loser. Yes, you too. And uh, happy loser to Kumpen La also. So, okay. Uh, uh, I have a question uh, regarding my daily practice, sadhana. So, I am yes. doing uh, my daily sadhana, say, say, for six, seven years now. So, sometime I feel that uh, doing after six, seven years, someday it feels that it's, the practice is not fresh as. Yes it was started like that. So how yeah. I keep that practice on daily as fresh as new? I know it's very hard to do it, I think. But I think I think the answer would be, Mahesh, not, you know, is that if your entire life, if you're practicing every moment of your life, if you're practicing everyday humility and practicing patience and practicing your devotion and practicing giving up attachment, then that will enrich your sadhana. But your sadhana in and of itself, it's obvious, it can't grow because it's not separate from the rest of your life. And it, But it's not easy because, you know, it's not easy to have joyful feelings all the time. We're not that realized. So some days it can be a bit boring. Do it with sincerity. But other days when your mind is more fresh, you can get some more joy from it. It's okay. But the whole life has to be practiced. And then your sadhana, which is just, it, that will definitely grow. But you can't expect it every day until you're highly realized, you know. Until you realize emptiness, you can't expect the joy every day. That's okay. Keep moving. 
fact that you do it every day is admirable. So well done. Yes, sir. I, I'm I'm doing. Uh, I enjoy the doing the practice daily, but I I good. got the answer what you are telling. Yes, yes. Good, good, good. Yes. Keep moving. Thank you. Keep moving. Thank okay. You. And then and I, I see. Are you coming to Pune? Come... What? Huh? Are you coming to Pune? Uh, Pune city. No plan lately. Oh, but you never know. Okay. It might happen. <laughs> But the other, remember the other thing, Mahesh, remember the uh -huh. other one, how karma works, is that even if it's a bit boring one day, the fact that you're doing it is you're sowing the seeds every day. You're keeping it alive. So it's all part of the process. So it's not as if it's no good. It's all, it's, it's incredibly beneficial that you do it every day. It's amazing you do that. So no, in the long term, it's fantastic. All right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Good, good, good. Poor people. What else do you think? What do you think, Kumpen, Kumpenla? Something to do, something to say? Venerable, can I ask something? Yes, you may ask something, Neil. Talk to me. Yes. Was that Neil? But now he's, he's muted himself. It's it's Neil. Uh, Talk to me, Neil. Kind of a question that, that pops up and uh, it's it's uh, it's been there. Uh, what do you possess more, your mirror imprint or image or your shadow? Well, my dear, I don't know what the shadow means. The mirror imprint, I mean, the Buddhism talks a lot about the mind is like a mirror. So I don't know the shadow part. Explain that to me. I think the shadow means that we are alive. I mean, that that every, every person sees their shadow, uh, whether... Uh, you go here or there, or whatever. Whether you're sleeping, whether you're doing this or that, uh -huh. so your shadow never leaves you. That kind of uh, thought process. I, I I don't know exactly what it means. I understand. So I, so I have to tell you, my dear Neil, I don't understand your question. I'm so sorry. I would like to. Can you ask it in another way? Uh, the the. Sh the shadow is your possession. Is it your possession? I don't know about that. I never think about my shadow. Is it, I think it's a different way you're talking, Neil. And I just, I don't understand. I'm so sorry. I would like to, but I just don't. What did you uh, mean by the imprint? That I liked. I liked that. What did you mean by that? By, by the by the self-image. I was thinking more on the lines of self-image. Like, uh, oh, self-image. Yes, the imprint that I get from the mirror is because I have an eye consciousness and I, I'm, I'm able to grasp that. And then I'm able to know that my shadow never leaves me, that kind of uh, line of thinking. I but see, okay. I don't, well, I can't really answer directly to that, but I think the one about the self-image is important because the, it's according to what the mirror, according to how the mirror is. If, if the mirror is covered with a bit of anger today, the image that returns is not a very nice one. But if the, Im but if the mirror is full of, of self-confidence and kindness, then the image will be very lovely. So I think it's focused on the mirror one. That's important. But it's dependent on the shape of the mirror, isn't it? The, the style of the mirror the quality of the mirror. That's very much the Buddhist view. I don't know, Neil. I can't be very helpful to you. I'm so sorry. No, you, you helped me. <laughs> Good. I'm happy. Okay. Hello, Anna. Talk to me. Alona, talk to me. Alona. Yes, sweetheart. Hi, Venerable. Yes. Happy Luzai. Yes. Nice to see you. Yes. Um... I have a question about um, uh, att uh, attachment to the light. Um, I got a new job, and it's uh, uh, it's I work with uh, twenty five women, and uh, um, you know attachment for them to approve me uh, and like me. It's um, uh, it's overwhelming. I do my practices, you know, and I do what I can. But would would you suggest anything else I can do to help myself? Well, you know, the fact that you notice it, like you've got your practice, Alona. You're doing your best. You notice it vividly. I mean, the fact that you notice it, you're aware of it, is really important. But just keep yourself steady. I mean, you've got to know on the on the one hand, like I just said before, 
always aspire keep yourself grounded in your broader motivation i always want to do what is most beneficial may i do what is most beneficial have that as your goal every single moment and then you will make the right decisions even if somebody ends up not approving of you you can't make the wish that they approve of you go away because you've still got attachment and you still haven't realized emptiness so it's going to be there but learn to ground yourself in this bigger aspiration I see I'm needy to have everyone love me, but and that's great, nothing wrong, you know, thinking I want to be a nice person, but always, may I always make the choices based on what's most beneficial. That's when it comes to the crunch. Are you the boss or what? You're not the boss, you're just a team. I wish, of, I'm not. <laughs> no, you're part of the team. I'm a part of the team, yeah. Okay, so just always aspire to do what's most beneficial. And then when the time comes, if you choose between doing what, will make the person like you or what's the right thing you'll choose the right thing so just it's training you've got to train alona that's it keep moving keep moving keep moving darling mm, thank you okay all right so listen nidhi and dinara have questions so we have time come on then nidhi talk to me nidhi talk to me sweetheart hi uh, i'm Hello. sorry for the I'm sorry for the background noise. Okay, um, I work as a psychotherapist and I counsel couples and I see that sometimes, you know, one person could be say a diagnosed narcissist and the abuse is a lot for one partner. Now, from the from the perspective of karma, because in a way like psychology says they don't even know what they are doing because you know their their brains are patterned in such a way. Are they creating bad karma or like... You mean because... a person who's very self-centered? Your yeah. question is, is a person who's very self-centered, are they... Well, of course they are. We are Every second we are all doing that, Nidhi. If, if we're just, you know, if we're totally involved in ourselves and overwhelmed by our own needs and can't see past our own nose, we're only mainly... We're, I mean, we mainly, first of all, creating suffering for ourselves because we're becoming more neurotic, more self-centered, and happiness will not come. And then, of course, on the basis of that, when it starts to become difficult in relationships, that person will become harming. Of course they will because, you, you know, attachment is so strong. So, of course, we're creating negative karma every second. But if the person is very self-centered but doesn't do too much to harm the other person, Person, then okay not so much negative are you seeing what i'm saying um, yes but what if they have a diagnosis which makes them behave in that way well i mean that's how you're talking you're talking from the psychological perspective a diagnosis that's how we yeah. talk in the psychological world but i'm talking the yeah. buddhist world i'm giving a buddhist diagnosis so what if they have got that diagnosis this is the interesting question the way you put it this is what we tend to think in the west we then think well i've got a diagnosis poor me i can't help it we tend to think that Oh, yeah. I've got a diagnosis, I'm psychotic, I'm this, I'm that, as if somehow it, you can't help it. And that's a big problem. We've got to be more, you've got to, your job is to enable that person to take responsibility and know they're not set in stone, that they can change. Do you see my point? Okay. Yes, yes, I do. That big way we use that in our culture is very scary. Oh, I've got a, I've got a diagnosis, which means poor me, I can't help it. Like it's a disease that's put on top of me. No, not like that. It's, it's very it can be dangerous thinking that way. Do you hear my point? Yeah, I do. I do. You've got to learn. To, you, your job is to help them to take responsibility, to know that they're not set in stone, and you you can change. You know, in, in your own kind way. Your own. So don't you get caught up in that either, Nidhi? Do you see my point? Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, that's important. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Hello, you. Dinara. What's your question, darling? Dinara, talk to me. Hello, Robin. I have a question, just a uh, kind of yes. personal. I recently moved uh, to US to live here and after yeah. living about seven years in India yeah. and um, I at the moment I'm trying to cover my basic needs and trying to settle down even though yeah. my heart I still is, is still in India you know and I, it was my heart I want to live in India but yeah. kind of uh, with my mind I understand that probably I have more opportunities here so yes uh, I'm just kind of uh, every day I'm doubting like is it the right place for me to stay or should I go back to India and just stay where where my heart is poetically saying you know so I see what you think so why did you move because of financial reasons oh uh, yeah I I have more opportunities here and just it's it's for quite your career, a you, for your career yeah. you mean well you know it's down to the same question as I asked before you've got to know what you want Dinara 
It's got it, it rooted. There's no absolute right or wrong, you know. And it might be that you've got to really check. You've got to almost like do some very clear analysis, do the the pros and cons of both things. And you really got to come to a clear decision, even though you might suffer as a result of one of one question. You've got to decide what's more what what is more beneficial. You've got to work it out. You've got to look at the pros and cons of each one and really check what is what is it you're trying to accomplish. What is it you want to do with your life? And what for the long term, what is the most beneficial? You've got to just really nut it out. It's not a it's not an emotional thing. Really look at it carefully. You've got you at this moment, you are here doing this. So don't get too caught up in it because things can change. But really look at the pros and cons of both and come up with a almost like a list. It's not mystical, it's very practical. And if it really is beneficial that you pro progress in your career in the long term for the benefit of you and your beloveds, then you do it and you will learn to be happy with it. But to live there, to have this constant tension between these two and not make a clear choice is very suffering. Do you understand? Thank you. Thank you. Good, darling. Well, Kun Penla, I think we're done for the day. Thank you so, so much, Venerable Robina. It's All so right. lovely to have you with us on, yes, happy, happy, on the happy. first day of the new year. Thank you so, so much. And thank you, and, everybody. Keep moving. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. And and uh, be inspired. Yeah, be inspired. But be inspired by our lamas, by these people showing us how we can become. That's it, isn't it? Thank you. You there? And I sent a little. Okay. Dashi perky jujing me talk tram re rappling zini de gyampa di sangye zindu mik te uva yi trokun nam dak zing la chu pa shok. Now may Venerable okay. Lama's life be firm, her wide divine actions spread in the ten directions. May the torch of the teachings of Losang always remain, dispelling the darkness of all beings in the three realms. Inam Guru Ratna Mandala and then just a light for this 90 minutes, 95 minutes that all these thoughts have gone in, they haven't gone astray, and they're all kind of gone into our mind as all part of this process of us being this work in progress. So to never give up and have the long term view, have aspiration, do what's most beneficial, and get courage and never give up. All right, people, that's all I say. Thank you, sweethearts, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for having me. All right, darling. Venerable Robina, come back very, very soon. Best sure, of person. I will. I will. Please, I please. Will. You need Bye. your inspiration. <laughs> Bye, darling. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Tomorrow we have Venerable Tupton children. As our guest, we move to 9 p.m. Indian time right? Uh, because she is on the west coast of uh, the US. She's an amazing, amazing teacher. Please join again if you have time. Also, in the afternoon, we have a hybrid session with our resident teacher, Venerable Wongdu, uh, at three o'clock uh, Indian time. Yeah, so uh, Venerable Wongdu will be here in uh, Tushita, uh, but we put it also online. So please join. Thank you so much. Have a good day, a good night. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.